Welkom aan de burgemeester van Leiden en aan de wethouders van Leiden en van Den Haag, onze tweede stad. Welkom aan de ambassadeurs en vertegenwoordigers van vele bevriende landen hier aanwezig. Een belangrijk deel van deze, van deze dag zal in het Nederlands zijn. Waar er Nederlands wordt gesproken, krijgt u een simultaan een vertaling. Dus als u dat niet krijgt, moet u even uw hand opsteken. Dat is ingewikkelde boodschap, realiseer ik me nu, want u verstaat mij niet. Hoe dan ook, daar hebben wij staf voor. Uh, ik wil ook hartelijk welkom heten Hans Schutte. Hij vertegenwoordigt ons ministerie van OCW. I welcome professor Stefan Collini and your wife. It gives us great pleasure um, to see you here at the opening session of our of the opening session of our academic year. I will come back to you shortly. Ik heet van harte welkom professor Piet Hein Donner, vicepresident van de Raad van State. Maar daarom zit hij hier niet. Hij zit hier omdat hij onze nieuwe Kleveringa hoogleraar is. Ik feliciteer hem met dit mooie ambt en wij zullen u terugzien in ieder geval op 26 november als u de Kleveringa oratie uitspreekt. Welkom ook aan al onze studenten die een Leiden University Excellence Scholarship hebben verworven voor het academisch jaar 2015-2016. Belangrijke, belangrijke beurzen, er zijn 61 van deze beurzen uitgereikt. En dan tenslotte natuurlijk onze eerstejaars eh, studenten van de vele bacheloropleidingen en masteropleidingen die wij hebben. Um, jullie zijn met 5000, ja niet hier, maar jullie zijn met 5000. Dat klinkt heel erg veel, maar daarmee is Leiden nog steeds een hele kleine en overzichtelijke, overzichtelijke universiteit. Het is goed dat jullie je hebben um, aange of aangemeld voor deze universiteit en ook in dit jaar. Dit is nog ons lustrumjaar. Wij bestaan 440 jaar en daar wil ik aan het eind van deze middag nog een paar dingen over zeggen. Ondertussen zullen de eerstejaars merken dat ze vanmiddag stevig zullen worden aangepakt. Het is voor velen het eerste college wat ze ontvangen. En ik zou zeggen, ga maar rechtop zitten. Bereid je voor. Ik wil ook alle studenten van de vele verenigingen die we hebben, wil ik, wil ik welkom heten. Dat zijn er Leiden is een verenigingenstad. Ik geloof dat we er bij elkaar iets van 250 hebben. Dat zijn natuurlijk disputen, sportverenigingen. Um, maar hier wil ik in het bijzonder noemen, maar ik zou er zoveel kunnen noemen. Um, van Augustinus zo'n 250 um, studenten, nieuwe studenten. En van Quintus zijn er zo'n 70 hier naar deze kerk gekomen. Ik zeg er meteen bij hoestend en proestend. Sommigen hebben nog maar net hun kennismakingstijd overleefd. Dus ik zou zeggen, het is geen... Geen enge ziektes hier in de kerk, het zijn maar eerstejaars die u hoort. Welkom voort aan alle collega's van onze mooie universiteit, de alumni en al die anderen die deze prachtige dag met hun aanwezigheid opluisteren. Ik heet u allen hartelijk welkom. Vanwege het college van bestuur, en dan zeg ik meteen bij dat collega Willem de Beest dit keer afwezig is... Deze week overleed een van onze gewaardeerde medewerkers en de familie vroeg Willem de Beest om bij de uitvaart te spreken. En die vindt op dit moment plaats en dat gaat vanzelfsprekend voor. Voordat ik een enkel woord ter introductie zal geven op onze spreker van, van vandaag, wil ik nog iets over die nieuwe studenten zeggen. Um, er zijn er zo'n ruim 5000, heb ik net gezegd, uh, maar dat zegt niet zoveel. Het is veel aardiger om een beetje induk te krijgen. Wat gaan die studenten, wat gaan jullie nu um, studeren? Ik heb maar in het wilde weg wat getalletjes genoemd, dus als u er niet bij zit en die kans is heel groot, volgend jaar um, ga ik in de herkansing. Het, waren er, het zijn er voor geschiedenis ongeveer 250, 250 eerstejaars geschiedenis. 50 voor de filosofie, hoezo in crisis in humanities, 50 um, studenten in de filosofie, ruim 100 voor Japans, ruim 300 politicologen, 
Bijzonder ook ruim 150 voor natuurkunde, wiskunde en sterrenkunde. Dus hoezo een probleem daar? Genoeg studenten zou je zo zeggen. 150 studenten in Life Science and Technology. Een belangrijke opleiding die wij samen verzorgen met de Universiteit Delft. 500 studenten voor onze opleiding International Studies. Een Engelstalige bacheloropleiding die wij in Den Haag verzorgen. 500 studenten, waarvan een belangrijk deel internationale studenten. 850 juristen, 500 psychologen en 150 biologen. En hierbij ben ik vast nog niet op een kwart van de, van de totaal aantal studenten uitgekomen. Maar het geeft u een klein beetje een beeld. Het zijn uiteraard allemaal maar getallen. Het gaat om iedere individuele student. Iedere student die hier in Leiden komt studeren is een individu en moet onze volle aandacht krijgen... Toch vind ik het interessant om die getallen te noemen, want we hebben nu in Nederland een nieuw systeem, het sociaal leenstelsel. Er waren zorgen dat dat wel eens tot minder inschrijvingen zou kunnen leiden. Studenten die af zouden zien van een studie aan de universiteit of aan het hoger beroepsonderwijs. Dat is dus niet gebeurd. Er zijn meer studenten dan ooit. En wat ik persoonlijk ook buitengewoon mooi vind, dat is dat ook de verenigingen op geen enkele manier hieronder geleden hebben. Ook daar waren we een beetje bezorgd over. Wat gaat dat leenstelsel? En toch de nadruk op wat vlotter studeren die door Nederland waait. En wat gaat dat betekenen voor de verenigingen? Ook de verenigingen hebben weer meer studenten ingeschreven eh, dan ooit eh, tevoren. Dus dat is prachtig en wat mij betreft ook, wat ons college betreft, heel goed nieuws. Dan zal ik nu eh, onze spreker aankondigen, dat doe ik met veel plezier. Maar niet dan nadat ik heb gezegd dat het muzikaal intermezzo vanmiddag wordt verzorgd door het Leidse Studentenkoor en Orkest Collegium Musicum. En het CM zal meteen na de speech van professor Collini optreden. Professor Collini. You are professor of intellectual history and English literature at the University of Cambridge. You are a fellow of the British Academy and a regular contributor to the London Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement and The Guardian. Most of us know you through your latest book, What Are Universities For? The book has received a lot of attention in the Netherlands and globally. It is beautifully written, it is witty, and it invites us to think more deeply about the precious gift of universities to society. There is probably no more amusing way to introduce you than in your own words. And I quote the Dutch translation of your book, um, the translation that is available at the back of the university. Um, after this ceremony. So, okay, so I'll, I'll translate you in, in, in Dutch. Ik, Stefan Collini, ben werkzaam in de kennis- en personeelsindustrie. Mijn bedrijf is gespecialiseerd in twee soorten van producten. Wij fabriceren hoogkwalitatieve, multi-inzetbare eenheden van menselijke capaciteit en wij produceren commercieel relevante cutting-edge kennis in gebruiksvriendelijke pakketjes van gedrukt materiaal. Ik heb een functie op middelmanagement niveau en ik ben verantwoording verschuldigd aan mijn afdelingshoofd dat op zijn beurt rechtstreeks rapporteert aan de CEO. Wij zijn concurrerend op de mondiale markt en onze naamsbekendheidsscore is hoog. Het motto van mijn organisatie is producten van wereldklasse tegen absolute bodemprijzen. That is a possible description, but certainly not one we feel very comfortable with. What you really say in your book, Stefan, is I'm a university teacher, I teach students and I write books. I'm part of what used to be a largely self-governing community of scholars. Teaching students, writing books and papers, and being part of a largely self-governing community of scholars. That is basically what the university is all about. We've asked you to speak on a question that intrigues us. 
who does the university belong to? As some of you may know, we addressed this topic 15 years ago. We published even a small booklet entitled Whose University Is It? edited by former science dean Frans Saris and former rector Dao Bremer. Today, this question is more relevant than ever. Last spring, the University of Amsterdam saw occupations of several of its buildings and some of the students and their faculty called for the removal of the members of their university board. And in the end, as we know indeed, Chair Louise Gunning, who, by the way, I admire tremendously, both as a person and as a university colleague, she had to step down. As we understand, there was also some unrest in your country recently, at LSE, for instance. And worldwide, a movement seems to be growing. We are the university of students and academics protesting in an effort to regain what they think they have lost over the past years. At Leiden, we don't have a tradition of occupying university buildings and driving rectors and vice-rectors away from the university. Fortunately, we prefer debate. For centuries, this university has held as one of its core values the sharing of decision-making among the different levels within the university community. I quote from our new strategic university strategic plan, the academic community determines the content and structure of the university's teaching and research. The academic community does that. And we are certainly not the only university to take this approach. Yet we have to admit that it is easier said than done. Mottos like, we are the university, can easily become empty rhetoric. Most universities are funded by taxpayers' money, so we need politicians asking for accountability. And students and their parents have to pay increased amounts of money for their courses at a time when society at large is going through a serious economic and financial crisis. Meanwhile, the world is crying out for solutions to a growing number of major challenges that we are facing every day. Challenges that politicians are not capable of solving without the help of the universities, their scholars, their scientists and their students. So we cannot simply fall back on our glorious past or refer to our most recent strategic plan. And it's for this reason that we have invited you this, for this opening ceremony of our new academic year. Of course, you're not alone in addressing the issue of the future of the university, but the fact that we invited a representative of a UK university is particularly important to us. Your university system, widely recognized as the best publicly funded system in the world, has been privatized further and faster than anywhere else. And as a result, English higher education is seen as the canary in the coal mine, a metaphor derived from the mining industry, where miners used to take a canary with them into the mine as an early warning system to detect carbon monoxide. And this early warning system Stefan, is one of the many reasons why you are here today as the guest canary in our Dutch mine of higher education. The floor is yours. Rector Magnificus, Mayor, colleagues, fellow students, ladies and gentlemen. As you might imagine, I feel very honored to be invited to give the address at the start of the new academic year at this venerable university. And I would like to at least try to say 
Het spijt mij dat ik mijn toespraak niet in het Nederlands kan houden. I suspect one function of my pronunciation of that sentence will be to make you all very grateful that this address is in English. Now, I hardly need to tell any of you that the question of the role and future of universities is just at present a matter of unusually vigorous debate, not just here in the Netherlands, but across Europe as a whole, and indeed in many other parts of the world. These debates tend, I think, to take a particular form in those countries, such as the Netherlands and my own country, where a system of publicly funded higher education has traditionally been combined with a considerable degree of academic autonomy for universities. Although there is much diversity, both between and across national systems, there are certain family resemblances among what simply as a piece of convenient shorthand, we may refer to as the European model of the university. And it is here that questions about public accountability have been posed most pressingly. But just as we should not let our shorthand deceive us into assuming uniformity, when there is in fact great diversity, so we should not fall into that kind of temporal parochialism that presumes these questions are unique to the present day. The truth is, I shall suggest, that societies have always wanted their universities to fulfill diverse and not always compatible purposes. And that universities have always been partly responsive to and partly resistant to those wider social demands. But although the structure of this dynamic endures, the content changes. Just as we no longer regard mastery of Latin and Greek verse forms as the hallmark of a gentleman, and would indeed be uneasy with both the class and gender assumptions built into such a term, so societies no longer regard the principal purpose of universities as being to provide ministers for the church or officials for the state, as they once did. Nonetheless, it's hard not to feel that at present we face a particularly delicate and contested moment in this long relationship, as global finance remakes the world in its own image. Return upon capital is the shaping drive of contemporary societies, which leads to an assertion of the primacy of contributing to economic growth as the goal and the extension of market-driven competition as the means. Universities are suspected of being, at best, irrelevant, at worst, obstructive to this agenda. And there is strong pressure for them to reshape their own activities so as better to further these economic purposes. At the same time, the extension of ideas of democratic accountability leads societies to search for mechanisms by which to test and measure the performance of universities, along with all other industries and services, thereby generating another set of tensions as mechanical procedures are devised which attempt to provide some reliable quantitative indicator of those forms of intellectual quality that can ultimately only be judged, not measured. The resulting tensions between such assertions of society's demands and universities' affirmation of their intellectual autonomy are what lie behind the current debates summed up by the question, who does the university belong to? This is obviously not chiefly a question about legal status, but about who gets to say what universities should be doing, about whose conception of their purpose should have most weight. This is the question I have been invited to address today. But I shall propose to you that we need to adopt a perspective which is less individualistic, less proprietorial, and less confined to the present generation. 
Although quite clearly there is no timeless essence of the university, I would argue that there is a long history with roots going back at least to the time of Wilhelm von Humboldt at the beginning of the 19th century, of seeing universities as partly protected spaces in which the extension and deepening of understanding takes priority over any more immediate or instrumental purposes. This idea has been powerful and in some ways resilient. It is noticeable that many institutions that were initially founded upon some other model, such as being a technical training institute or a community college, have aspired to what is perceived to be the status and freedom of a university, but that no university has ever made the journey in the reverse direction. Part of the complexity of the history of universities in most European societies lies in the interaction of two patterns. On the one hand, long-established universities have frequently responded to pressures to accommodate new subjects or to educate students in new ways in response to changing social and economic demands. Yet on the other hand, institutions founded to further particular local or immediate aims have over time shown a tendency to devote themselves principally to more disinterested, long-term forms of intellectual inquiry. So critics have frequently claimed that universities need to be recalled to the socially valuable purposes of studying and teaching useful subjects rather than what are sometimes stigmatized as useless academic disciplines. The truth is, of course, that the distinction between the useful and the useless is a rhetorical construction with no fixed or determinate content. Intellectual inquiry is itself ungovernable. There is no predicting where thought and analysis may lead when allowed to play freely over almost any topic as the history of science abundantly illustrates. It is sometimes said that in universities, knowledge is pursued for its own sake. But that may slightly misdescribe the variety of purposes for which different kinds of understanding may be sought. A better way to characterize the intellectual life of universities may be to say that the drive towards understanding can never accept an arbitrary stopping point. And critique may always, in principle, reveal that any currently accepted stopping point is ultimately arbitrary. So human understanding, when not chained to a particular instrumental task, is restless, always pushing onwards, though not in a single or fixed or entirely knowable direction. And there is no one moment along that journey where we can say in general or in the abstract that the degree of understanding being sought has passed from the useless to the useful. In other words, it's not the subject matter itself that determines whether something is at a particular moment classed as useful or useless. Almost any subject can fall under either description. The study of classics was useful for the early modern statesman and administrator, just as theoretical physics may seem useless to the contemporary entrepreneur. Rather, it is a question of whether inquiry into a subject is being undertaken under the sign of limitlessness. That is to say, not just, as with the development of all knowledge, subject to the testing of hypotheses or the revision of errors, not just that, but where open-ended quest for understanding has primacy over any application or intermediate outcome. This, we might say, is one mark of an academic discipline. And for this reason, attempts to make universities into a type of institution where scholars and students study only what is currently deemed useful are bound eventually to end in failure. The attempt 
itself can, of course, do untold damage, and I am not proposing that we should take much comfort from this thought. But all endeavors after systematic understanding of some particular subject matter are prone to generate further reflections on the limitations or premises of that understanding, which cannot themselves be entirely corralled or subordinated to present purposes. Moreover, present purposes soon become outdated but the forms of inquiry they provoked do not, or at least they get absorbed into continuing larger inquiries. From time to time, efforts will be made by governments or other representatives of the presumed needs of society to redirect these energies in some currently favored practical direction, which partly accounts for the continuing gavotte danced by proponents of the useful against the useless. And within what I'm calling the partly protected space of the university, various forms of useful preparation for life are undertaken in a setting and manner which encourages the student to understand the contingency of any particular packet of knowledge and its interrelations with other different forms of knowledge. In other words, in brief, a university education has to be in large part, an education in a discipline, though what is really happening is that it is education through a discipline. Now, this dialectic between the push of immediate local pressures and the pull of long-term open-ended inquiry can be illustrated from the histories of universities in various countries, but I hope you'll forgive me if I take one from the country that I know best. From the mid-19th century onwards, the business leaders in the great provincial cities that had grown up in Britain as a result of the Industrial Revolution, cities such as Birmingham, Manchester, and Leeds, supported the establishment of institutions that would both prepare young men, though not at that point usually young women, for a career in commerce or industry, and also would develop inventions and processes which would benefit those local industries. The existing universities of Oxford and Cambridge were perceived as remote, conservative, clerical, and irrelevant to the needs of these booming industrial centers. The new University of Birmingham therefore decided to have a faculty of commerce, something that sounded like a contradiction in terms to the representatives of the traditional universities and the University of Manchester in the great capital of the cotton industry would have a laboratory that conducted research into textile manufacturing. The young gentlemen of the traditionally privileged classes scoffed at the evident Philistinism of these new institutions. At Liverpool and Birmingham, they get degrees for making jam. But there was no evading the logic of the Faustian Pact. An institution that wanted to develop applied science had to have teachers who could master the underlying pure science. And that is necessarily an ever-moving frontier. An institution that wanted to teach commerce was quickly drawn into appointing those who understood the principles of economics or the development of recent and not so recent economic history and so on. And there was also what we could call either civic pride or a kind of cultural snobbery, whereby those who wanted their universities to take their places among the world's great institutions of higher learning knew that they must also have departments of mathematics and astronomy and philosophy and classics. So powerful were these impulses that already by the early 20th century, the most influential school of medieval historians in Britain was to be found not in one of the ancient centers of learning, but in Manchester. But I want to illustrate this theme more concretely, indeed with a, a literally concrete example, by referring to the facade of the main building at the University of Birmingham, 
which finally received its charter as an independent university in 1901. When Josiah Mason, a successful local businessman, had founded a college in the city almost half a century earlier, he had insisted that it was to be, and I quote, devoted to systematic education and instruction specially adapted to the practical and mechanical requirements of the manufactures and industrial pursuits of the Midlands district to the exclusion of mere literary education and instruction, end of quotation. So this represented the assertion of social purpose in its most imperious form. But by the time the new buildings were being erected in the first decade of the 20th century, there was a strong feeling that the larger dignity of the university's purposes should literally be carved in stone. Accordingly, three of the four main friezes on the facade of the Great Hall represented several types of local industry, drawing on the applied sciences. But the fourth, over the central entrance, signaled something else, something intended to be emblematic of learning, something that, as it was put at the time, refers to the function of the university at large. And this message was made even clearer by the placing of nine statues in niches over the main entrance. Those of you who know universities will not be surprised to know that initially there was some conflict and discussion about who should be represented in this way. Some tension between the desire to have figures with a connection to the Midlands district and a desire to choose representatives of, as it was put, the great men of all time. This did lead to some rather implausible claims. The composer Felix Mendelssohn, for example, was proposed on the rather shaky grounds that the first performance of his Elijah had taken place in Birmingham Town Hall. Special interest groups had their say as well. Not surprisingly, the Faculty of Commerce proposed Adam Smith for inclusion and so on. But eventually, the inevitable compromises and opportunism of the committee process issued in the agreed nine statues who adorn this facade to this day. Well, before I relieve your tension by announcing the lucky winners, let me just remark the presence of two 19th century assumptions that operate less powerfully today. One was the veneration of an agreed canon that represented a wholly unrelativized notion of culture, and the other was the propensity to express important public convictions by means of statues. Modern sensibilities are both less prone to carve sermons in stone and much less deferential to the idea of great men and not just because of their maleness. But the first principle of the new university insisted that in choosing the representative figures, a broad view should be taken because, as he said, the university in the future will include all branches of learning and not merely the more technical branches which are in special evidence today. So, the statues finally selected to represent this ideal were grouped in threes. On one side, were Darwin, Faraday, and Watt. On the other side were Beethoven, Virgil, and Michelangelo. While the central trio comprised Shakespeare, flanked by Plato and Newton. I won't ask you to put your hand up if you got them all right. It was a clever compromise. Science and engineering were represented by Faraday and Watt, both of whom came from the Midlands district. The biological sciences by the great Darwin, who came from the neighboring county, and mathematics and physics by the immortal Newton. And of course, Shakespeare himself, who came from just down the road at Stratford-on-Avon, was another local boy made good. It's true the Midlands connections of Plato, Beethoven, Virgil, and Michelangelo were a little more obscure, 
but they nonetheless signaled the ambition of the university to be, as the principal said, not just an institute of applied technology, but a school of general culture in the great European tradition. Now, there's much more, of course, that could be said about this example, but I'm sure you recognize the general point. Universities respond to local needs, but they also partake of a wider inheritance, and therefore I would suggest also of an open-ended future. No one, not even a wealthy local businessman who provides a large donation, can altogether determine their character, and that returns me to this theme of who owns the university. Although I'm not addressing this question in legal terms, it may be helpful at this point to borrow a term from the legal framework governing many public and charitable institutions in the English-speaking world, such as museums and galleries, as well as universities. Such bodies are often placed under the care of a board of trustees. And a trustee is, of course, not an owner. Trustees have numerous duties and obligations, but no property rights. And the very category of trustee raises the question of who they hold their institution in trust for. And this is one of the points at which we have to think beyond the present generation. In my view, the fatal conceptual error involved in the new university funding system introduced in Britain in 2012, which the rector referred to, is that it treats the fee as a payment by an individual customer to a single institutional provider for a specific service in the present. By contrast, I think the proper basis for funding education is a form of social contract whereby each generation contributes to the education of future generations. It cannot be for a specific service because the customer in the form of the student is not in a position to know in advance exactly what benefit they may obtain from a university education. And it cannot really be to a single institutional provider because each university is only part of the world of learning. None of what they provide for their students would exist except for the work of many people over many generations in many other institutions. So what we call a fee is not really the price of a product. It is an undertaking to contribute to the costs of the system. In this respect, it is more like a tax, just as a tax is the tithe which the citizen, as a member of society, pays towards the upkeep of that society. So. A university fee is more like what in Britain we call a national insurance contribution, a recognition of human solidarity in facing the common perils and opportunities of life. So this should make even clearer that the individual student is not paying for the libraries and laboratories in which they work or for the training and salaries of their current teachers, since that expenditure was necessarily incurred a long time ago. They are paying towards the maintenance of these things in the future, and it is a long future. Moreover, universities do not fulfill their purposes merely by means of the formal instruction they offer, but by nurturing a broader atmosphere of open-ended inquiry. Although academic life has its hierarchies, it is in one sense irreducibly democratic in that arguments and evidence are, in principle, sovereign, no matter who advances them. Let me illustrate several of these points with a small autobiographical story. I am shamelessly using it here as an idealized parable, and the only excuses I have for telling you a story about myself are, first, that it actually happened, and second, that it has the merit of making me look ridiculous. When I was an undergraduate, I attended the annual dinner in which final year students mixed with the academics who were fellows of their college. 
I was seated across from a much older man whom I had never met before. And in the course of the evening, we fell into a discussion about such small topics as what the basis of law is and what the limits of the law's regulation of individual life should be and so on. Now, as it happened, I had just that week been set to read the classic works by Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill on the theory of utilitarianism for my course in the history of political thought. And so, helped by the generous supply of college wine, I found I had many brilliant opinions to express on these topics. I started to argue with this older man with all the assurance of a 21-year-old who, a few weeks earlier, had never heard of utilitarianism, but who now knew exactly what was wrong with it and why no reasonable person could seriously entertain it for a moment. He argued back, thoughtfully and tactfully, but also with some vigor. We must have argued for quite some time because suddenly I was aware that most of the other diners had left and the staff were beginning to clear the tables. My interlocutor graciously said that he had found our discussion very interesting and we went our separate ways. I went to bed extremely pleased with myself for having so triumphantly set him straight about the obvious defects of the shallow theoretical position he had tried to uphold. It was only the next day that I learned from one of my fellow students who my interlocutor at dinner had been. It turned out that he was none other than Professor Sir Glanville Williams, at that time probably the most highly regarded modern exponent in the world of the legal and political theory of utilitarianism. I was, of course, mortified that I had made such a complete fool of myself but as the years have gone by, I have come more and more to admire what Glanville Williams did that evening. He hadn't talked down to me or condescended to me or dismissed me. He had, or so it seemed, taken me seriously as someone to disagree with, and he had done so above all by meeting my half-baked arguments with better arguments. I think that evening he gave me an invaluable lesson, not just in understanding utilitarianism, but in understanding what universities are about, including the thought that the freedom to make mistakes may be crucial to the process of learning itself. Of course, in turning this selectively remembered experience into an illustrative anecdote, I tacitly idealize it, but that may not be such a bad thing to do in the context of today's ceremony. Glanville Williams is long dead, and I suppose I am now, in my turn, likely to be perceived by the current generation of students as some old man across the table. But that sense of the obligation to hand on to others something precious that was in our time handed on to us should be both a chastening and a fortifying conviction. Chastening because we are all too aware that we are pygmies standing on the shoulders of giants. And fortifying because there is something endlessly vigorous and self-sustaining in the enterprise of truly open-ended inquiry. An energy that is most evident, I think, in the student body. An energy that's not easily suppressed or dammed up. No matter how foolish or dogmatic we may sometimes be. Just as the arguments for and against utilitarianism didn't belong to Glanville Williams any more than they belonged to my opinionated 21-year-old self, so the university, the indispensable setting in which all such arguments can be explored and developed without limit, does not belong to any one party in the present. One of the most striking features of those accumulations of deepened understanding and exact knowledge that we call scholarship and science is how small a proportion of them were created by those who presently hold posts in universities. What a customer buys from an individual university is not a product or service that that university has created. It is access to a complex, 
intellectual and cultural inheritance that is only maintained and passed on in the present by the combined efforts of scholars and scientists and students all over the world, a population that is frequently mobile and constantly being renewed. A single isolated university is, strictly speaking, a mirage, just as inconceivable and unsustainable as Marx long ago pointed out was the Robinson Crusoe model of economic man. Ask yourselves, what proportion of the books and articles students at Leiden are asked to read, or what proportion of the equipment they use and the experiments they replicate were written or created by the present members of the academic staff of this university? If we cannot say who owns an idea that was first thought 50 or 100 or longer years ago, but is now discussed in seminars and laboratories across the world, so we cannot in any useful way say who owns the universities in which such thinking is done. Of course, we have evolved such legal instruments as copyright, patents, and intellectual property rights generally, but most of what happens and really matters in both teaching and research is very little dependent on such instruments. I may quite properly have to pay for the permission to reproduce a poem by a living or recently deceased poet for a class discussion. But everything that happens in the minds and imaginations of the readers of that poem, all the accumulated criticism and critical attention that is brought to bear on it, all the comparisons with countless other poems that are implicit in all characterizations and judgments of it, all the knowledge of the language or of the verse forms or of the history that are presupposed by any probing discussion of it, we do not pay a fee to the owners of the rights of these things each time we open our mouths or sit down at our keyboards. Like all social institutions, universities have developed over time by a process that includes accident as well as design. A process that has taken different forms in different periods and different countries, a process we don't even now altogether understand and are not wholly in control of. Perhaps we could imagine a world in which universities never existed. We could certainly imagine a world in which they are very different from how they are now. Indeed, our descendants may well be living in such a world before too long. But they are what, as things have turned out, we now have. And we would surely be foolish not to recognize the immense value mankind has, my, excuse me, mankind has derived from having institutions in which pushing at the boundaries of present understanding is not a secondary or instrumental aim directed just at a particular local outcome, but is the very rationale of those institutions themselves. Such a rationale is compatible with various forms of funding and governance, as the diverse history of higher education amply attests. And I'm not suggesting that this perspective dictates one set of answers to the questions currently troubling this and other countries. But I would suggest that such a perspective should have a chastening effect on any attempt to treat universities entirely as businesses whose profits can be accurately quantified, or to treat academics as operatives whose output can be exactly measured, or to treat students as consumers the satisfaction of whose wants is the only relevant index of educational success. The premises of market individualism encourage us to think in terms of property rights, personal, exclusive, enforceable. Even by asking the question, who does the university belong to, we risk colluding with this language, language which is, as always, so much more than just language. And we risk losing our capacity to articulate the conception of a collective but intangible enterprise, sustained across time, both past and future, which is not the property of any one individual or group or institution or even generation. 
A university understood in this way certainly doesn't belong to the government in The Hague or to that nebulous entity called Dutch society or to the good citizens of Leiden. It doesn't belong either to taxpayers or to donors, necessary though their contributions may be. It doesn't belong to the professors, who sometimes think of themselves as the one indispensable element. And it doesn't belong to the students, who are periodically tempted to stake a symbolic claim by repossessing an institution they feel is rightfully theirs. It doesn't belong, for all the magnificence of his title, to the rector magnificus, and nor does it belong to all those catering and support staff who might well say in Brechtian vein, first there is lunch, then there is studying. Universities belong as much to those figures represented on the facade at the University of Birmingham as they do to those whom the philosopher Edmund Burke called the generations yet unborn. Just as this particular university belongs as much to the first year student who today begins one of the most exciting or most worrying, but anyway most intense experiences of his or her life, as much to that student as it does to the shades of Hugo Grotius or Johann Heutzinger. If there is any value in reflecting from time to time on the unanswerable question of who the university belongs to, perhaps it lies in this, in reminding us amid difficult political and financial circumstances, that we are only the trustees for the present generation of a complex intellectual inheritance that we did not create and which is not ours to allow to be destroyed. Thank you.
collega Musum, fantastisch. Um, heel goed um, gedaan. And um, thank you, Stefan, for this exciting um, speech. Um, and moreover, we are tremendously grateful that you will, if you've offered us the opportunity to, um, to discuss your speech tomorrow at 11 at our law school. Dr. Kasper de Jonge from our Faculty of Humanities has organized this small symposium starting tomorrow morning at 11 and continuing through lunch. Seven of our colleagues from different Leiden faculties will respond to your speech of today and in five or six minutes each and we will have a discussion with the audience moderated by Kasper. And for all of you who want to join us tomorrow, please refer to our website. Stefan, once again, thank you so much. This morning I sent you an email. I received one in return. It turned out to be an automatic reply and it said, I'm on vacation. I'm on vacation until Wednesday, Stefan. Well, I hope and I trust that you love your vacation here in Leiden. Thank you once again. En dan zou ik nu graag um, het woord willen geven aan collega Simone Buitendijk voor het volgende onderdeel en daarna meteen door met collega Van der Loes. Simone. De belangrijkste taak van onze universiteit is het opleiden van een nieuwe generatie wereldburgers. Is het vormen van onze studenten tot academisch denkende doeners. Die in staat zijn bij te dragen aan het oplossen van de grote uitdagingen van de wereld in het heden en in de nabije toekomst. De basis van al het onderwijs ligt in ons onderzoek. Maar het wetenschappelijk opleiden en maatschappelijk voorbereiden van jonge mensen vormen het hart van onze universiteit. De oprichting van de Teachers Academy is een van de recente activiteiten waarmee we duidelijk willen maken hoezeer onderwijs een prioriteit is. In 2014 zijn de eerste tien Teaching Fellows geïnstalleerd. Uitstekende onderzoekers met een extra warm kloppend hart voor onderwijs en onderwijsvernieuwing. Binnenkort wordt een tweede lichting bekendgemaakt en aan de groep toegevoegd. Teaching Fellows krijgen een geldbedrag voor het onderzoeken van hun eigen onderwijsinnovatie. Ze vormen de kern van een beweging die ertoe moet leiden dat effectief gebleken onderwijsinnovaties verder worden verspreid binnen onze universiteit. Dr. Anne-Marie Wilson is een Teaching Fellow van de eerste lichting. Ze is een Harvard graduate en sinds 2011 docent aan het Leiden University College in Den Haag. Zij is de inspirerende leider van een project dat tot doel heeft om studenten als onderdeel van hun opleiding actief te betrekken bij het oplossen van grote maatschappelijke problemen. En die problemen zijn ook te vinden letterlijk naast de deur, namelijk in de gemeenschap van de stad Den Haag. Haar project past naadloos bij de onderwijsdoelen van de Universiteit Leiden en bij de doelen van de Teachers Academy. Het College van Bestuur hoopt dan, ook dat, hoopt dan ook van harte dat bewezen succesvolle onderdelen van het project wijd zullen worden verspreid binnen de hele universiteit. Ik wil nu graag Anne-Marie uitnodigen om ons meer te vertellen over dit prachtige community service initiatief dat tot doel heeft om studenten te leren al tijdens hun studie global citizens te zijn. Anne-Marie? Zou je op het podium willen komen? It is a tremendous honor to be able to speak with you this afternoon and to share a podium with Professor Kalini. His question of who do universities belong to is also very much of interest to me and to my students and colleagues at Leiden University College. LUC is the International Honors College of Leiden University, offering a broad interdisciplinary liberal arts and sciences curriculum focused on the theme of global challenges, 
a theme that befits our location in The Hague. Our city is home to over 160 international organizations, and there is no doubt that they enrich the education we deliver. For example, students majoring in international justice can sit in on hearings at the Yugoslavia Tribunal or the International Criminal Court while taking classes with professors who have direct experiences uh, serving in those very bodies. Similarly, many of our world politics students do internships at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is located right next door to our college building. But as important as these institutions are, The Hague is much more than just a collection of NGOs and governmental agencies. It is a vibrant, highly diverse community made up of long-standing residents, recent immigrants, itinerant professionals, and students, and in recent months, growing numbers of refugees. It is important that our students get to know this Hague as well. Just as we wish to send our students out into the community, though, it is also important that we welcome Hague residents into our own auditoriums and classrooms and into the broader intellectual community of the university. Again, we ask the question, who does the university belong to? And this brings me to the teaching and learning that I've been asked to tell you about today. A few years ago, some of us at LUC got to thinking that we could do more to help our students explore how so-called global challenges operate not only at a distance or in the abstract, but also right here at home. We also thought that we could might add a more concrete side to our curriculum in global citizenship. In collaboration with the municipality of The Hague and with support from the Leiden Teachers Academy, we decided to establish a service learning program that would invite LUC students to study a local challenge, and in the first instance, we selected multicultural education, while also doing volunteer work relating to that issue. So in this case, that was serving as language tutors in local schools. Service learning is a fairly common form of pedagogy in the United States, particularly at public universities. The idea is simple. By combining academic study with practical, hands-on service to the community, students connect theory to practice while also relating their own personal experiences and their own individual learning to the experiences and indeed the expertise of people outside traditional university classrooms. At the same time, partner organizations benefit from the volunteer service of energetic, enthusiastic young people, while also sharing their own resources and ideas with people beyond their institutional boundaries. So what does this look like in practice? In my course, I met weekly with 20 really inspiring, curious, and committed undergraduate students to investigate the challenge of multicultural education. And we did this from a variety of disciplinary angles. We studied history, philosophy, sociology, pedagogy, public policy, even film. We compared Dutch educational experiences to cases from other countries, and we welcomed a range of visiting speakers, all of them practitioners, teachers and teacher trainers, administrators, policymakers. Along the way, students wrote weekly reflection papers and two substantial essays. What made this course special, though, and what I think will stay with the students more than any book or article they may have read, was the experience of tutoring in the Hague neighborhoods of Mariehuve and the Schilderswijk. Dutch education minister Jet Bussemacher, in an interview in the Volkskrant last May, said that she believes that, quote, studenten often to out hun comfort zone moeten komen. Ze moeten geconfronteerd worden met iets wat buiten hun eigen wereld ligt. Students must step out of their comfort zones and be confronted things with things beyond their everyday worlds. And this, I can assure you, is exactly what happened when my students first set foot into high school classrooms in The Hague. 
learning how to connect with diverse groups of young people, learning how to think on their feet, figuring out how to ignite learning and how to maintain their composure when that ignition sometimes faltered, as inevitably it sometimes does. By the end of the course, my students had gained first-hand experience of what it might be like to work as a secondary school teacher, a career pathway that some of them are now considering. They also learned about and directly experienced the ways that policy decisions, as well as historical traditions and public discourses, shape the everyday lives of teachers and students in ways both positive and negative, intended and unintended. And finally, they explored sides of The Hague that many of them had never seen before. At the same time, local secondary school students received more one-on-one -on -one attention than is typically possible in an ordinary classroom setting. They gained more experience speaking English and for the newcomers speaking Dutch than they would have otherwise. And simply through conversation practice based on real issues, they also taught my students about their perspectives on education, migration, and politics in the Netherlands. So I believe there were worthwhile rewards here. One of them I observed at the end of the semester when LUC hosted 80 students from the Johan de Witt School for a tour of our college building and an introduction to life at a university college. These 80 students, all of them recent arrivals to the Netherlands, hailed from all over the world, from Turkey and Poland to Syria and Sierra Leone. The LUC students who welcomed them were also a highly international bunch. And on that afternoon, students from both schools greeted one another in at least a dozen languages. From where I sat, obser observing their laughter, their energy, and the bonds they had clearly developed over the preceding months, it certainly seemed like a fulfillment of at least one of the promises of multi multicultural education, which is building solidarity across difference. And on that afternoon, it really felt that our university, our college, belonged to all of us. It is my hope that some of those young people from Johann de Witt School will be able to come to study at LUC, particularly as we expand our scholarship programs work that is both urgent and crucial. At the same time, I hope that some of my own students from LUC will go on to become teachers in their own right, either here in the Netherlands or in their own home countries. I think they would be fantastic at it. And as far as LUC is concerned, I hope we can continue to expand our community engagement efforts. I will be teaching this course again twice in the coming year. And through our Engage the Hague program, which grew out of this course, Students can already find opportunities to volunteer with a variety of local organizations and to participate in locally engaged research projects led by LUC staff. And I invite you to visit us on, on, on the web and, of course, Facebook and Twitter, where we, we happen to be. In closing, I want to emphasize that the exchange of ideas and resources between universities and local communities is potentially very powerful. And it is also accessible. To succeed, community engagement projects like this one don't necessarily require massive financial outlays. But they do demand a shift in our thinking about the kinds of practices we want to encourage and reward within universities. And I think the Leiden Teachers Academy is a perfect example of what a difference such encouragement and reward can make. After giving this course, I've realized that university instructors like myself share much more in common with secondary school teachers than we typically recognize. All of us benefit from close attention to the development of our craft. All of us benefit from institutional frameworks that take teaching seriously as intellectual and professional work. And all of us benefit from spaces that invite us to talk to one another and, and value one another and support one another when it comes to our work in the classroom. And so I just want to say thank you to the Leiden Teachers Academy and to Vice Rector Simone Boutendijk and also to the Dean of LUC, Jo Schrake, for taking teaching seriously and for being open to new kinds of pedagogy and new kinds of professional spaces. My final thanks, though, 
go to my students who worked so hard in this course and who taught me so much and who are the real reason I find teaching so rewarding and so much fun. Thank you. Het laatste programmapunt voor de afsluiting door de rector is de uitreiking van de Gratama Wetenschapsprijs voor jonge onderzoekers. Dames en heren, een van de onderzoeksthema's van de winnares van de Wetenschapsprijs is diversiteit in organisaties. Een thema dat hoog op de maatschappelijke en universitaire agenda staat. En dat is niet voor niets. De diversiteit in onze universiteit neemt steeds verder toe. En alle onderzoek ernaar leidt tot de conclusie dat wij een betere universiteit zullen zijn indien iedereen de kans krijgt zijn of haar capaciteiten ten volle te benutten. En de laatste tijd worden we er af en toe aan herinnerd dat we het op dat vlak nog niet goed genoeg doen. Maar laten we er niet omheen draaien. Diversiteit kan ook een probleem zijn. Bijvoorbeeld wanneer je als selectiecommissie de beste jonge onderzoeker moet kiezen uit voordrachten van zeven faculteiten. Zoveel diversiteit dat het vergelijkbaar is met het kiezen van de beste Olympische atleet. Prestaties die een honderdste van seconde worden gemeten, moeten worden vergeleken met juryoordelen en met teamprestaties. Selectie van de winnaar van deze prijs was dus een moeilijke opgave die niet te min met vreugde is uitgevoerd. Want Olympische Spelen zijn leuker dan een WK. Juist vanwege de diversiteit aan disciplines. En het is een voorrecht om deel uit te mogen maken van deze permanente Olympische Spelen. Als u mee deze kleine ontboezeming uit de commissie toestaat aan het begin van dit nieuwe seizoen. De winnaar van de wetenschapsprijs beheerst meer dan één tak van sport. Dr. Jojanneke van der Toorn heeft in haar jonge carrière al veel grenzen overschreden tussen disciplines en tussen landen. Zij voltooide twee studies op masterniveau, culturele antropologie en sociale psychologie, beide aan de Vrije Universiteit. Haar afstudeeronderzoek deed zij respectievelijk aan An Giang University in Vietnam en aan Harvard. Zij promoveerde aan New York University in de sociale psychologie. Vervolgens was zij postdoc aan Yale met een rubicon subsidie van NWO en sinds 2012 is zij universitair, universitair docent in Leiden. Haar onderzoek betreft momenteel een vijftal onderwerpen rond de thema's macht en leiderschap, immigratie, cross-culturele verschillen in rechtvaardigheidsgevoel en sociaal-psychologische aspecten van poli politieke oriëntatie. Haar onderzoek naar system justification is origineel en invloedrijk. Het gegeven is enigszins contra-intuïtief en wil zeggen dat mensen in afhankelijke posities met weinig invloed en macht bestaande structuren toch als rechtvaardig kunnen beleven en legitimeren en daarmee ongelijkheid in stand helpen houden. Met onderzoek naar het mechanisme heeft Van der Toorn een brug geslagen tussen politicologie en psychologie. Sinds haar promotie onderhoudt zij ook een onderzoekslijn over vooroordelen en omgang met diversiteit. Dat zij ook op dit onderwerp excelleert blijkt uit een auteurschap van een artikel in Science, waarin een wetenschappelijke benadering wordt voorgesteld om vooroordelen te bestrijden en diversiteit en excellentie in academia te bevorderen. Deze veelbelovende ontwikkeling wordt nu tussentijds bekroond. De Gratema Stichting heeft in 2011 de wetenschapsprijs ingesteld die vandaag in Leiden voor de derde keer wordt uitgereikt. De Gratema Stichting steunt het Leids Universiteitsfonds niet alleen met deze prijs, maar al enkele decennia via jaarlijkse subsidies voor onderzoeks- en onderwijsprojecten. Daarmee is deze stichting een steunpilaar voor het LUF, tezamen met enkele andere stichtingen van alumni. De prijs zal nu symbolisch worden overhandigd door Jan Gratema, voorzitter van de stichting, waarna de laureaat 
zal toelichten hoe zij de prijs zal aanwenden. En ik nodig hen graag uit nu op het podium te komen. <laughs> en u zult zien, we zijn nog maar net op tijd met het uitreiken vandaag van deze prijs. <laughs> Een weekje later en het was misschien niet meer gelukt. <laughs> Het is mij als juryvoorzitter een eer en een genoegen, mevrouw van der Toorn, dokter van der Toorn, om u van harte geluk te wensen met het winnen van de Gratema Wetenschapsprijs en u de bijbehorende attributen te overhandigen. In de eerste plaats heb ik hier voor u een check. Ik ben niet helemaal zeker of er in Nederland een bank te vinden is die deze check zou willen verzilveren. We zullen voor alle zekerheid het bedrag er maar overmaken deze week. Dan is er ook nog een, uh, naast de geldprijs een oorkonde aan verbonden, waarvan de tekst als volgt luidt. Uh, op voordracht van de faculteit der sociale wetenschappen van de Universiteit Leiden, uitgereikt aan dokter Johanne Maartje van der Toren, voor door haar verricht vernieuwend, maatschappelijk relevant en smaakmakend onderzoek. Ik feliciteer u nogmaals van harte en ik hoop dat u ons bij tijd en wijle nog wilt informeren over de progressie in uw wetenschappelijke carrière. Van harte geluk gewenst. Het is een enorme eer om vandaag deze fantastische prijs in ontvangst te nemen. En ik wil de Gratema Stichting en de verschillende juries hier aanwezig heel hartelijk verdanken. Deze prijs is niet alleen een kroon op mijn werk tot nu toe, maar ook een aanmoediging om te blijven doen waar mijn passie ligt, onderzoek dat zowel theoretisch als praktisch relevant is. Want dit is volgens mij waar het om draait in de wetenschap, dat we uiteindelijk iets kunnen met de kennis die we genereren, dat is in mijn ogen de echte wetenschapsprijs. Mijn werk richt zich onder andere op de sociale psychologie van diversiteit. Zo onderzoek ik bijvoorbeeld de voorwaarden voor succesvol diversiteitsbeleid om het aandeel vrouwen binnen de top van organisaties te verhogen of om de samenwerking tussen mensen met een verschillende etnische achtergrond te bevorderen. De Universiteit Leiden maakt zich sterk voor het werven, stimuleren en binden van al het beschikbare talent. En ook het bedrijfsleven is doordrongen van het belang van diversiteit en inclusiviteit voor innovatie en welzijn. Dit betekent een unieke kans voor onderzoekers zoals ik om op basis van wetenschappelijk verkregen inzichten een bijdrage te leveren aan de maatschappij. De Gratama Wetenschapsprijs stelt mij in staat deze onderzoekslijn naar diversiteit verder uit te breiden en te integreren met mijn eerdere onderzoek naar de motivatie van mensen om de status quo in stand te houden. Beide onderzoeksgebieden zijn nog niet eerder aan elkaar gelinkt, terwijl dit mijn inziens kan leiden tot vernieuwende inzichten met belangrijke theoretische en praktische implicaties. Ik zal de prijs inzetten voor een studiebezoek aan de Verenigde Staten om dit onderzoek samen met collega-wetenschappers voor te bereiden en voor de daadwerkelijke uitvoering van het onderzoek. Daarnaast zal ik aan onze universiteit een publiek symposium organiseren dat niet alleen een platform verschaft voor het delen van wetenschappelijke kennis op het snijvlak van diversiteit en sociale verandering, maar dat ook een uitgelezen kans biedt om met elkaar in gesprek te gaan een knelpunt in de uitvoering van beleid te behandelen. Zo hoop ik een bijdrage te kunnen leveren aan het debat rondom diversiteit dat momenteel op de universiteit, in het bedrijfsleven en in de maatschappij gevoerd wordt. Ik wil de Gratema Stichting hiervoor heel hartelijk danken voor haar bijdrage aan deze plannen en voor de geweldige eer van het winnen van deze prijs. Dank u wel.
Wij komen langzamerhand aan een, aan een afronding van deze prachtige uh, middag, denk ik. Mijn vrouw liet mij net buienrader zien. Dat ziet er... Uh, in ieder geval zou ik lang op de receptie blijven als ik, als ik u was. En, want het wordt, het wordt erg over een paar minuten. Um, het, is ons, het is ons lustrum. Ja, het is toch wel goed om dat nog even te zeggen. Vergeleken bij Cambridge is het ontzettend jong, maar het is 440 jaar bestaan we deze universiteit in deze kerk opgericht. We hebben het dit hele jaar gevierd met een hele bijzondere dies. Vele van u waren daarbij en vervolgens de sportdag. Een enorm feest. Ook, ook het verschil bij deze, zes, bij deze bijeenkomst kan niet, kan niet groter zijn, de jeugd van tegenwoordig. Maar dat was ook hier in deze, in deze kerk. Ik wil nog wijzen op een heel bijzonder initiatief van de Lakenhal die in de meelfabriek, u weet de Lakenhal die wordt, die wordt onder handen genomen, maar die heeft ons een een, een, een tentoonstelling cadeau genaamd Global Imaginations. Dat is in de meelfabriek. Dus vele sterren in de Volkskrant en NRC. U moet daar gaan kijken, maar u hebt nog maar een maand. Dus u moet niet, niet al te lang, uh, te lang wachten. Het blijft tenslotte niet regenen. En tenslotte is er het derde luik van die DS. En dat is um, de Nacht van Kunst en Kennis. En dat zijn die foldertjes die u hier ziet staan... Um, een enorm succes al een aantal jaren en wij hebben daar als universiteit ons lustrum ook voor de alumni um, aan gekoppeld. Maar iedereen, studenten, um, leien naar Den Haag, al, iedereen is um, van, van, harte, van harte welkom. Dan, um, ten slotte, um, van het boek van Stefan Collini is um, de Engelse um, Penguin, geloof ik, versie um, is, is beschikbaar achter in de kerk. Dus daar kunt u de Engelse versie kopen. Maar er is inmiddels ook verschenen, en die komt vandaag uit, een Nederlandse versie van zijn boek. Ik meen dat het heet, ik, ik had hem even bij me moeten hebben, waar is de universiteit eigenlijk voor? Ligt daar ook in grote stapels, ook te koop als u dat um, zou willen. Dus de Engelse versie is daar. En de Nederlandse versie is daar. Daar ligt ook het lustrumboek van um, onze eigen Willem Ottespeer. Die heeft onze universiteitsgeschiedenis nog eens prachtig um, op papier gezet. Ook een prachtig um, boekje. Het ligt daar. Dus drie boeken. Dan is er een vrolijk initiatief van studenten geweest. Die hebben bier laten brouwen door onze eigen studenten. Dat zijn studenten die bierbrouwer zijn geworden hier in Leiden. Die hebben een lustrum voor pack hebben ze um, gebrouwen. Karelsberg heet het. In ieder geval, u kunt het um, daar ook krijgen. Het draagt, um, het draagt bij de opbrengst aan het lustrum cadeau. En dat hebt u in de, in de gids gezien. Het zou volstrekt ongepast zijn om in deze um, ingewikkelde wereld waarin we op dit moment leven... Um, om net te doen alsof er niets om je heen gebeurt en alleen maar te feesten. Het, zou, het is dus heel goed om ook aan de buitenwereld te blijven denken. Daarom is ons Lustrum cadeau daar ook op gericht. U kunt dat vinden in, um, in het boekje. En daarmee is deze middag tot een einde gekomen. Ik wil in ieder die hier aan heeft bijdragen ook de ondersteunende staf zeer hartelijk um, bedanken voor deze prachtige middag en voor alles wat zij um, hebben gedaan. En ja, we hebben het gehoord vanmiddag. We wisten het ook eigenlijk wel. De wereld heeft ons nodig. En hiermee verklaar ik ons academisch jaar 2015-2016 voor geopend.